of uh, Harold Anthony Dye. I started off in the artillery, when you find artillery army. Well, I was actually on the, my family lived in Atlanta, Georgia, until I was getting ready to be born. My mother went back home to Dothan, Alabama. I was born there, stayed there for two weeks, and came back to Atlanta. I went to Georgia Tech, took the ROTC program there. I did take the ROTC at Boys High School in Atlanta, which no longer exists. Then at Georgia Tech, and when I graduated, I became a second lieutenant in the reserve. I worked for a year and a half or so before Pearl Harbor in 1941, and they called me up as a second lieutenant on the day after Pearl Harbor. The first year of the war, first part of the war, I served in California. We thought that the Japanese after Pearl Harbor would, uh, we lost their fleet. We didn't have a very good fleet after that. We thought they might attempt to land at San Diego. San Diego being kind of an isolated part, separated from the rest of the United States except by two highways, one up to Los Angeles and one inland over Highway 80. It would be an ideal place for them to land, so I was sent out there to, as artillery to defend the coast against the prospective landing. Then I was transferred from there to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and from there to Europe. Well, I thought it was a pretty good idea, and I always was refighting the war between the states. That was a customary thing for boys of my age to do, and the ROTC program just fascinated me, and uh, did pretty well. It, Boys High School, I got to be the cadet colonel, which was big shot in those days, you know. Uh, and then uh, I just decided that'd be a good idea. But I actually went into, as a ceramic engineer from Georgia Tech, I went into the ceramic business until they called me up because I was a reserve officer, so that that's all there was to it. I didn't enlist or anything like that. We were prepared for it. And uh, since I was in California for that first... Uh, and married for that first few months. I, my wife could actually come out there. Then when I went to Fort Bragg to train to go overseas, uh, it was pr pretty hard to leave them. And uh, besides that, I was leaving a little girl too. And uh, it's hard, but then, you know, you have a great feeling about service to your country. It overrides everything else. At least with me, it overrode everything else. And so I was willing to go, and we thought that it was absolutely necessary that Hitler be stopped some way or another, and especially since the Japanese had done what they did. And we knew all the records. We knew what they were doing. And so I said, just service to my country. And we knew what was being done to the Jewish people in Germany. We understood that. And we, of course, knew what the Japanese had done at Pearl Harbor and then what they were doing, what they would do from then on. But before that, we knew the Japanese were pretty ruthless in some of the things they were doing. But the idea was to stop Hitler and his advance, because all he had to do was take one more country, like England. And of course, uh, taking England, uh, we studied the battles leading up to that ahead of time, even at Tech, like the Gunkirk operation and all that. We saw that on the TV a little bit, but we read about it an awful lot of it and knew about it. So that would encourage almost anybody to realize we had to do something about it. That is, if they read the newspapers and so forth. And I had heard first-hand reports from Army officers and from the military reports uh, to know that uh, it was a terrible situation. And we also knew that Hitler was, well, he came so close to taking England with, at Dunkirk, before Dunkirk, that it was a miracle it saved yet. By the way, I wrote a little article about that in your that book that I have there about the Battle of Dunkirk, but the actual battle that uh, saved the British Army was fought up on what they call the Eye Canal up in, you remember Flanders Field and Flanders Field, the poppies blow? That's where they sit in the First World War. Well, in the Second World War, the Germans under von Rundstedt had moved across with their, with their divisions of armor, and they had defeated the French, the British, and everybody else that faced them. The British were in mad retreat to get to Dunkirk, and uh, the German army came up to there, and Rundstedt stopped. He had what they call a phase line, that is to stop at the Eye Canal long enough for all the troops to get lined up and ready, prepared to go as they were supposed to, and he uh, ordered that phase line stop. But when the phase line 
stop for, I think it was for two hours he ordered. When it was over with, he said, well, Art, let's go. But Hitler, from his headquarters back in Berlin, had said, uh, stop the advance at the Eye Canal and don't go forward until I tell you so. We later found out that Hitler had said he was going to leave the destruction of the British Army to the Luftwaffe, German Air Force, because of his friend Goering. Well, they stopped for a couple of hours, and then Rundstedt asked for permission to go ahead because he, he in fact, uh, sent a message that the German army would, would capture the whole British Army and could destroy it right there, and they could have. That Hitler wouldn't let them go. And it finally, uh, Rundstedt, the uh, commanding general, I may have mixed up my names here, Guderian was the one who was doing the command of the army. Rundstedt was commanding general of the whole German army, and he appealed to Hitler, let us go. Hitler wouldn't stop, would let go. Just like old Nebuchadnezzar back in the Bible stopped him. All right, well, it, anyhow, uh, Sepp Dietrich, who commanded the Adolf Hitler division, finally tore up his orders to stay on that canal, and he went ahead with his division to the coast. And he reached the coast, and with his division, and they only had little 88-millimeter guns, you know, that's about that big around, firing on British destroyers and cruisers out there who were protecting the retreat from Dunkirk. Well, that couldn't do the job, so the British Army escaped with about 800,000 men, all because Hitler had stopped the army back on the Eye Canal. And I don't say there's anything in the world but uh, Providence had stopped them. But knowing that and studying it and reading about it and hearing about it made us all say, we've got to get into this battle, we've got to stop this advance. Because Germany immediately started their strikes on England, and you know how they destroyed Coventry and all those places. Well, that was well known to us. So anybody that did a little thinking would say, you've got to stop. And I think I was thinking in those days. I think the Pearl Harbor word got to us on a Sunday, and I believe it was Sunday. I was coming from Atlanta, Georgia, back to Augusta, Georgia, when I got it on the radio at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was kind of late, but I don't know what I'd been doing all day, but anyway, I heard it on the radio. I said, uh-oh, and I could realize that something had happened because the Japanese had no reason to do that unless they were sure of themselves, but they did it anyhow. And I said, I guess we go get called up. But the next day I had my orders. So I was with my wife in the car and my little daughter behind us. We had one of those coupes where you had a, is that the proper way? Yeah, Coop, yeah. where you had a little space behind the seat back up there. And she was asleep back up on that part. And it was raining, and I was on the way home from to Augusta. So I do remember. Well, I came right back to Atlanta to, to Fort McPherson to take a, preliminary test, as soon as they found out I was able to walk and do all those things, they sent me to, to uh, Camp, uh, well, Fort Bragg again, from Fort Bragg to Fort Jackson. Fort Jackson, I was sent to California. A lot of it was going from unit to unit and finally settling down with an artillery outfit, which we trained from scratch. We got the people right off, right out of the repel depots or replacement depots and stuff like that. We had to train everybody. We had to learn it all of ourselves, but I had plenty of experience in how to fire, to fire direction and that kind of stuff, so we trained, we mostly were training the people to work on the guns, load them, all the things that were necessary to be done, and, and the basic training in all respects, but mostly uh, attempts to uh, refine our ability to shoot get things done. Basically, we have to make it possible for the infantry to first to protect them from others, from attack and so forth, and to pave the way for them to attack, and to counter battery, that is to control the artillery from the other side. There is a great little painting on the wall at the artillery school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, that expresses it very well. It's a uh, shows a big pile of men all throwing arms and legs flying everywhere there and just big pile fighting, you know. They caricatured in a way. And off to the side there is a man standing by an old fashioned cannon with the with his torch that he lights the fuse to let the cannon go. Everybody understands what's happening. 
and the cannon is placed right at the battle, and it says, in effect, down below them, artillery lends dignity to what otherwise would be a common brawl. And that's what we do. We place the fire support where the infantry wants it, and we try to make it possible for them to survive. I went back to Bragg, and there we trained, we finally trained, we finally trained our uh, battalion for overseas. Maneuvers and all the things that we did there for a few months, then went overseas. Went right into a training over at a place called Red in England. Rannicket Barracks was the name of the place for our battalion. It was an old British uh, training camp. And uh, we had barracks and everything there. But we didn't have a place to shoot. We only had a place to train and fire dummy rounds and do everything in the world to get prepared. Be sure all of our equipment was 100% okay and everything else. And we did that. We then went down to Southampton after we were ready to go. The day before, we went down to Southampton several days before D Day and stayed in Southampton at the port with the artillery battalion until D plus nine. In other words, we didn't uh, get to go into battle on D-Day or anything like that. And the artillery didn't generally do that because the infantry had to clear the beaches and all. The artillery, some of us fired from our ships into the, uh, from the ship with artillery firing. Land-based artillery firing from ships is very difficult. But we did some of that. But I didn't land until, I said nine, but it was seven days later that we landed with the artillery battalion. We soon caught up with the infantry and started doing our job. They, Infantry had a tough time, really, with limited support to begin with because they didn't get the artillery landed. They had a tough time getting out of the beachhead and the end. But when we got all the artillery there and everything else going, then we started moving pretty fast across France. Artillery didn't move like the armor did. Now, you know, some of the armor divisions got out and took off, Patton and his bunch with the 3rd Army. And I was in the 3rd uh, Army for a while. Then I was in the Seventh Army. Now landed as an independent artillery battalion in the 21st Corps, but we landed there and fought across in support of uh, mostly of the uh, of infantry, of course. And as we crossed uh, several different times, we just bogged down. We'd start firing, clear the way, move on. Did a lot of that kind of firing all the way across France. And then it was towards the end that it began to get interesting when Patton started his big swing around the left flank. And a Patch came up from Italy, and we started across through the Vosges Mountains. And that's where I got assigned to the 7th Army. And across, across the Vosges Mountains uh, was difficult for a while. But when we got out of the Vosges Mountains, we fought in the Alsace-Lorraine in the Battle of Colmar, which was getting close now to the... Well, we had some bulge problems in the meantime, and I was down in Alsace Lorraine when the bulge occurred, and my battalion did not get to get into the bulge while the Germans were coming through, but we got up to the edge, moved overnight on snowy roads and everything else. We got to the shoulders of the bulge, I would say, and we began to fire into this German support things that were coming up, their tanks and everything else. And we really cut their supply lines completely to pieces. We had some pretty close contacts at times with, with small units of the Germans. We were not anywhere close to one of their big, their main plunge that went towards Bastogne. But we, uh, we got to fire in the bulge in support of the American troops there. Mm -hmm. Of the artillery always firing where they need support. And cutting off the supplies early, German ammunition and stuff like that, 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 that helped stop the bulge. That helped stop the advance is what we could do to their rear areas. And we could do it because I had the artillery could fire 25,000 yards, you know. And you can sit somewhere here. That 25,000 yards is 15 miles. And you can do a lot of damage in 15 miles if you know what you're shooting at. Well, I think uh, the most interesting single incident would be crossing the Rhine River. Well, we came up to the Rhine and... Uh, the propaganda was that Germany was going to make the Rhine River run red with American blood. And he put that out all over the world. And you know, a lot of us begin to believe that Rhine River is going to be rough. Now, we had already broken through the Siegfried Line. That, 
In fact, they had abandoned most of it. We had knocked out some pillboxes. Montour had done that with, uh, on the Siegfried line and uh, at least silenced them. You know, it's hard to blow up a pillbox. It's got 15 feet of concrete on it, but you can sure kill everybody inside of it just from concussion if you can get anywhere close. So we had done a lot of that. But we came up to the Rhine. I moved my CP in. At this time, I was a, act, I was a battery commander, and I moved my headquarters up to the uh, edge of the uh, Rhine River Del uh, Rhine River Levee, on the back side of it, a little town called Rhine Durkheim. And there was a three-story house there. And the top two stories were above the uh, levee, but the bottom story and the basement to that, in fact, two two floors below, was perfectly safe because we had the two floors above to stop any shells burst from above, and we had the levee in front of us to stop anything from the, the ground. So it felt real good, best place we ever had. And we, while it was there now, uh, my battalion headquarters got hit just a little before that. So from that place, I was also acting as the operations officer for the battalion. So it was a, a battalion, you know what that is, that was three batteries at that time. Well, the, uh, I put a forward observer up in the top of the building, and he knocked a tile roof and had a little hole through which he could look there, and perfectly safe because the tile roof was pretty good, too. We thought the Germans were going to be terrible the next morning when we got ready to cross because this was after dark that we moved in there. But we went ahead and uh, observed in about 11.30 at night a German battery from up on the hill on the other side of the Rhine fired a, what I would refer to, or they referred to as a ranging round. And that round hit about, uh, first of all, my observer saw the flash, and he ran the BC scope close over to it and got just about the angle that the round had been shot from, and it hit somewhere close to a crossroads back there, pretty close to it. But we had the flash, and we immediately sent some people out there to uh, check if we could find anything from a shell crater to tell us some direction and everything else and what size round it was. It sounded like an 88 millimeter, which it turned out to be. Well, he got that flash, and then a few minutes later, they fired another one. And this time, he got it perfectly, so we had a direct line of sight on a map, photo, aerial photo map, which was accurate. We could locate pretty closely the position from which he fired that round. So we came to the conclusion there was a German battery, at least a battery up there, that the next morning would go Regis King. Well, we decided we would not fire on that battery at the time. I called the Corps headquarters and notified them of the target we, that we had located, estimated it to be a German battery at least, and asked for something that hadn't been done before. So could we fire so that as many battalions of artillery as possible could hit the target all at one time. We now call that time on target. At that time, we didn't have a name for it, so we said, all I'm going to fire, and they said, the cook came back to me and said, well, you, you, you take command in, of that particular mission. So I notified the other fire direction officers and all the other battalions that we would fire on this set of coordinates, which we'd worked out, and we would fire it at exactly, I believe it was, uh, about 5.50, it was about 20, 20 or 30 minutes before we were supposed to go across the river. So we prepared to do that. Now, just before we talk about our troops at the time, the infantry was lined up on the back side of this levee to cross in the morning. The assault bolts were put over, pushed over on the other side. We knew that it was going to be terrible for them to cross. They did too. The infantry were just, it was rough on them, thinking about it. All this propaganda they had heard about how terrible it was going to be, and it was, it was rough. You, you, you can imagine, I heard a lot of praying from my headquarters right there beside the infantry almost. And uh, it was just, just a rough night, but we expected a lot. We didn't have any more of that kind of firing, so it took the time on target came up, and everybody fires his rounds so that they would all hit the target at the same time. If one guy's firing 15,000 yards, he's got to get the time of flight for his battalion or, or his battery to hit there. And uh, if another is firing at 20,000 yards or 12,000, they all figure the same times of flights to make it hit. And when they fired it at that time, you never saw such a beautiful coverage of a 
target area in your life with all those flashes up there. And they fired three rounds on the same target. The first one hit them. Then we took our batteries and fired along the river banks on the other side to be sure that there was nobody going to catch us as we went across. Germany, uh, the American infantry crossed the next morning. The regiment that we were behind lost one man, just one. No bloodbath, no nothing. He fell out of the boat and he had so much equipment he drowned. That's the only man that we lost. The whole division crossed without losing much of anything. Next day, two days later, after we built a pontoon bridge across there, I went up as I was going on further into Germany with the battery and saw that hillside where the battery, German 88 battery, just as we'd expected. The Germans were still there, dead, I mean. Their horse, horse drawn, believe it or not, even at that time. Terrible. The guns, the weapons, the German 88 millimeter, I saw one where two had just been hit in the middle and it had dropped down like a like a broken stick, you know, all sorts of things. Not a live man anywhere. I saw the battery commander, the place where he had been in a foxhole back there, still had his soldier's book, which is a, which is a, same as I dog tag for all practical purposes. And the soldier's book had his name in there. I remember we left the soldier's book with him, which we spoke to, so that he could later be buried. And Germ made the Germans, I guess, in the neighborhood come bury those people later. But not, I don't know anything about that. But the guy's name was Karl Heinz Hoffmann. He was captain. Well, we went on into Germany. And that was, I think, the most incredible incident of all was how that happened. But you know, I was in Germany in 1970, uh, 1963. Uh, this time I was a full colonel and I commanded an artillery group, which is three or four, but five battalions at that time. And we were in maneuvers down in that same part of the Odenwald, it was called. Not the Black Forest, but the Odenwald. About the same thing. And the Germans sent a cadet liaison officer over there. Or may have been not a cadet. He may have been just a second lieutenant. But he was a young man. He was sent over just to observe. They always did this. The Germans, we, we cooperated very greatly with the Germans in trying to build their forces and ours up too. And they were very cooperative about it. And we helped them build a good army. Anyhow, this lieutenant reported to me, along with some others, but you know what this man's name was? What? Carl Heinz Hoffman. Did you? And you know, I forgot to tell you that in my CP that day, that night, before we fired that TOT, some German woman had been abandoned by everybody else that evacuated the whole front. But she was having a baby, and the baby was born at the same time that we fired that T.O.T. I think maybe the vibration got the baby there. But, you know, that baby was Carl Heinz Hoffman that I met oh, several, 20 years later. The battery commander was the, his, his father. His father was going to fire on his own house the next morning. But he knew, of course, the father would have known that his mother had been evacuated from that position and gone on with the rest of the Germans. She was the only one on the, that side of the Rhine that night. I think that's the most interesting thing that I had happened to me, and the most, I don't know, providential, I just can't imagine ever seeing the, the battery commander's wife and then the baby that's born, at the time we kill it, kill the husband, is the son or the husband. Well, you got it. Now, we had some times when you have artillery fire coming in or something like that. Those are tough times, and you're not so sure of yourself. And, of course, we had an incident on the bulge where we thought we were going to be German troops were going to overrun us, in which case we artillery can't defend itself very well uh, in infantry fighting. Those were tough times. But I think the toughest time that I can recall is that same time that we were crossing the Rhine that I told you about, uh, the next day, after the went across the Rhine, we were building a bridge, pontoon bridge. We couldn't cross because it had to get the bridge built. Our tour was too heavy to get a boats to cross, and uh, had to get the bridge built. Then they had to let the army get in to across the bridge first. And they did that, and we were safe standing up on the side of the uh, levee there, uh, watching things just enjoying it because of 
looked, and I looked under the line and said, we're standing there, just a group of us, too close together for war times, but we were safe, we thought. And uh, we didn't have a bit of problem with feeling secure and everything. We were talking about how, to, well, it looks like it's through now because we had such an easy crossing compared to some of the things that would still happen. And at that moment, somebody up in the hills had fired a, what appeared to be an 88 millimeter round, an armor piercing tank round. It might have been one of our own, shooting at something, but it was a stray round, and it, it hit my lieutenant right here in the chest. We heard it whistle just a little bit, but the whistle really comes after the impact. And, and so the impact hit him right in the chest. Of course, killed him instantly, blew him back but most have penetrated, and we, we were unhurt. But that was the most shocking thing because we felt like we'd been providentially guided all the way through. Everything had worked so beautifully, and then the lieutenant had gotten killed. And that was the worst day of all for me, unless, unless you have to consider Buchenwald, because I did later on. My battery was the first first unit to break down the gates of Buchenwald. I think we were ordered up there by mistake because we were ordered from up from way down south. We got the orders, secret coded orders to move up directly to my battery, which was very unusual. They should go through the battalion. But they came to the battery. I, of course, notified the battalion, but the orders were to go to a certain point and be prepared to move on. The route and everything else was given to me. We followed that route, picked up by the MPs and carried through, so we knew something very unusual was happening, but we didn't know what. Finally, about uh, oh, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, still dark as everything, I got to the point that they told me to get to and was met by a lieutenant who had a half track. It's like a truck, except the back wheels are a uh, track, you know, like a tank. Okay, front wheels, automobile, automobile type. Very good weapon for weather and all that sort of stuff. Very good thing. He had, I don't know what he had, only 50 caliber machine guns, I think. Anyhow, we, uh, he was to take me where we were going. And he guided us. We followed him. By the way, on coming up there, we had gotten in with, between tanks and everything else with our artillery. Uh, we had priorities, but the priorities simply said infiltrate into the line. And Patton's army was moving so fast with all of his, uh, uh, his armor moving up, and we had to go forward with them, and then we'd cross. It's hard to explain without a map, but at any rate, we made that cross uh, back across the line from the back of the area up across to the left-hand side of the Third Army up near Weimar, Germany. And we were picked up by that lieutenant who took us to the Buchenwald took us to a point from which he said was yours now, and we could look out and see, uh, not really see, but shadows of a vast concentration camp. And it was still a little bit too dark for anything else. And so that was it. He was through. And that was to move into the camp. That's all it said. I had to move in, take over the camp. Now, that's hard to do, to take a battery of about 165 men. Not infantry, but artillerymen, armed with little old carbine rifles, not, not good M1s at the time. Could, could, uh, go in. We did have some 50 caliber machine guns, but take over a concentration camp. We knew there would be a whole bunch of German guards there and everything else. But as we scouted around, lieutenants and everybody else scouting around, we couldn't find, see any signs of life in any of the guard towers. So we finally got to, uh, waited for daylight. And uh, right in front of me was the gate, and there was nobody in front of the guard tower on the outer wall, and then the inside wall had more guard towers, but the outside wall guard towers were sp well spaced, oh, 500 yards apart. The inside ones were only a couple of hundred yards apart. So it was very obvious this, this place wasn't built to keep people out, it was built to keep people in. And so uh, we knocked down, uh, took one of my head, uh, Half tracks that had a, a blade in front to knock off uh, anything like a barbed wire or something strung across the ignite bombs, two things like that. We had run out uh, men down with uh, 
mine detectors to see if the road had any mines in it. We couldn't find anything, and no guards or anything. So it just, just would give you the creeps almost to see. Here's this great vast camp, nothing going on, absolute silence, absolutely no life that we could see. Still pretty, just getting light. When we got light enough, we went in, pushed the gate down. They weren't even locked with chains or anything like that. Pushed them down, went on in, and we got inside. I followed that half track with my Jeep. I had my first sergeant sitting on the left side there, and I was up front there, and the driver, and we went in. Had an interpreter sitting with us, too. And all of a sudden, here comes a mob of people, these German uh, Jews, mostly. Well, I don't know if they were mostly Jews, but they were Poles, Czechs, everything in the world. Terrible-looking people, hungry, wanting food. Some of them could hardly walk. There was a stack of dead bodies over to our left where people that, well, I don't want to go into all the gruesome details with you, but it was a horrible experience. I know one guy walked up to us, crawl, almost crawled up to us, clawing up, and, uh, and uh, my first sergeant couldn't take it. I hope this, you, know, you need to cut this out of this, whatever you talk about. My first sergeant vomited on him, and when he did, one of the other guys started licking up the vomit. Now, that's how terrible this situation for food was. It was an awful thing, and uh, we, saw, we realized we couldn't do one thing about it, so I got this my interpreter finally stand up and try to get some order, and there were people there that could understand him and say, we're going to have to get out of the camp. We'll be back in. We'll be feeding you, some of you, as many as we can. We'll be feeding you at 1,000 hours, which is two hours from now or something like that. And uh, we backed out, backed out. I'll tell you, that's a job. Uh, and they wanted to come out too, but most of them would not cross that line that the Germans had set up for them inside. Because usually when they crossed a certain line there, they got shot, killed right there. And they wouldn't do it, even though the Germans had left the camp. The German guards had abandoned the camp the day before, but they had locked all the people into their barracks. And these that came out had finally knocked down the door when they finally heard that Americans were out there, you know. And they probably knew it when we first moved up, some of them, because it was just, it's, it's unbelievable. But uh, at any rate, they, they met us in that form and we went out. And then we started trying to find food. We fed them as much as we could. We, the experience of Buchenwald, that's a long story itself. Uh, the concentration camp, the way they did their extermination and all that is, is horrible. They had those furnaces. Just as a matter of interest, in 1963, when I commanded the artillery group, I commanded the battalion which had command of Dachau, the city of Dachau, the concentration camp at Dachau which was exactly like the one at Buchenwald. And I have pictures of my wife standing on a mound, well, right beside a mound of uh, dirt about as tall as you are. And it says, it's a little sign there in German and English, but these, these, this mound, uh, the ashes of 50,000 Jews. There are some others around the same place there, Dachau. I never went back to Buchenwald. I didn't want to go back to Buchenwald. But Dachau they have now made into a great museum. Most of this, most of it they destroyed, but they've kept a, they've kept enough of it to let you know what was going on. And those barracks were terrible things. There was about that much room between layers where you'd sleep. You, a man with wide shoulders couldn't turn over, for example. He had to sleep on his back or his stomach or whatever if he could sleep. And there were just wooden floors for all practical purposes. And several layers like that, they could stack up, they could stack hundreds of people into what would ordinarily hold 40. But after that, there was nothing that could bother us. And we were, we were moving behind the lines, not firing, except until the last part of the war, the last few days. I finally, we finally caught up with the armor, mainly because the armor stopped at the Austrian border. And I was ended up the war at a little place called Peisenberg, Germany, which is just above Garmisch Partenkirchen, which is now an army recreation area, as you know, a wonderful area of Olympics and everything else. But my battery did, the last thing we did in the way of fighting the war was 
to fire on a German armored train that was up in the hills about uh, 15,000 yards from us. It stopped. The, the armored train had been commanded by uh, mostly what they call Jugendstiff, I think that's the right word for it. Young men, I mean young boys, and old, old men on this armored train, and they were going to try to stop the advance of it by blocking the road across with the armored train, or some way, I don't know how they were going to do it. Not wasn't well thought out. But at the last minute, uh, we fired on that, we fired on that uh, train and blew some of the trains off the track and into the road and all sorts of stuff like that. But luckily for the Germans, the German boys, they'd wanted to fight to the last. They did fight from then on. You know, every now and then you bump into a German uh, boy about 12, 13 years old that would, would blow himself up just like the Muslims are doing today in order to get some Americans or get a machine gun sometimes and wait in the woods for the Americans to come. And they, they were the hardest of all to deal with at the end because you hate to shoot a 12-year-old boy or something like that. We hated to shoot that bunch up on the hill. But some of the old men up there, old Germans, that said, let's get out of here and made the boys quit themselves. And I think most of them were not in the train. I never got up there to find out because the observers reported the train destroyed. But that was my last day of combat. Up until then, we, up until then, we were spending our time looking for scientists. Because all the German scientists, and we thought all the others, especially radar scientists, we thought of them as radar scientists. They may have been atomic scientists or something else, I don't know. But we found some of them down there. They were down in Bavaria. That was the last place that the Germans, had. they were trying to stay away from Russia. We wanted them ahead of the Russians. The Russians were coming in, and we thought that, in fact, we bumped into Russians now and then a little too far into our land. But we, uh, we found some German scientists. Uh, my battalion did. I never did bump into one, but uh, we, we did. that was our last real mission. I was uh, up in a little place called Murnau. We were up there now. We were trying to keep the Germans from it. The, Russians from infiltrating across into our territory, and that's about all we were doing, guarding it. That's where VE Day occurred. We were not, at the end, worried about the Germans at all. Mm -hmm. We were worried about the Russians, and Bavaria was a real hot spot to be in because uh, they, we thought, I mean, I, I remember German officers surrendering to us and saying, we want to, we want, give us some weapons, we'll join you. We've got to stop the Russians. And that's all they were like thinking about. They were thinking of Stalingrad and all that, and the terrible things that the Russians did. In spite of how bad the Germans were to the Jews, they weren't, they weren't as bad as the Russians were to their people. Because the Russians killed 25 million of their own people. And, and, and they knew it. The Germans knew that. And they didn't, the German, regular German army, I don't think they, they didn't have much admiration for the Hitler. They didn't man the, they did not man their concentration camps with regular Army German troops. They manned them with special SS types, and people from uh, they brought from the Ukraine, places like that. Because the Germans, too many of them, not enough of them rebelled, but a lot of them did rebel against. It. I remember one German officer telling me once said, uh, I asked him, uh, why in the world did you put up with a place like Buchenwald? This guy had been, at one time, had been in one of those concentration camps as, as a, you know, I think it was a commander of it. Well, not, no, no, it wasn't a commander, he was deputy commander, let's put it that way. And he said, uh, well, it's very simple. He said, uh, if you didn't do what they said, they, they would always remind you of your family back home. It's uh, something like, uh, do you still live at such and such place on Wilhelmstrasse? Is your family still there? Well, are you going to do this or are you not going to do that? And you'd say, well, I'll do it, yeah. You know, I had this same thing happen to me in Korea. Now, this is jumping wars, and I don't think it was meant the same way. But uh, also, uh, one of the, my counterparts, I was on what they call the 
Joint Observer Team, where I met with the communists out in the, met with the North Korea, called the North KPACPV, met with them about the armistice out in the demilitarized zone. And uh, one of those times, this guy kept asking me questions about my own, first time I met him, asked me how the Brooklyn Dodgers were going to do. And I said, I said something to the effect, we're supposed to talk about military business, not personal business. And got along fine. It, next time he asked me something else. And one day, the same guy asked me, does your wife still live at such and such address on Rock Springs Road in Atlanta? And I said, Lord knows. Now he's got me because she did live there. Well, he was informing me in a sense that he knew everything in the world about me. Now, he wasn't saying to me that if I don't answer his questions, uh, something's going to happen to my wife. But he was, in effect, telling me he knew so much about him. It reminded me of what would happen to the German officer under the same conditions. Had something like that been coming up to me and I was going to carry out a bad order in, uh, over in Korea, and he said, does your wife still live there? I'd say, well, let me get it to the oil. Let me get it done, because I'd think back to my wife and family. And I think that happened to a lot of Germans. They did it to protect their own families. Well, I thought I, I never found a person that I didn't like and I didn't admire. I did have one lieutenant colonel commander early in the war, commander in the battalion, who drank too much. And we had to get rid of him. But when he was sober, he was one of the finest guys you ever saw. But any time, he was just an alcoholic. That was the only thing wrong with him. But other than that, I didn't find anybody that I didn't admire. I, didn't, I understood the orders, and I understood why they were given. I understood sometimes that the orders that are given to you are not what you would want to do, but then you don't know the whole story. And so I feel like that. I just, I admired so many people that were just plain heroes in everyday life, in everyday things that they did. Like, uh, well, I can think of uh, so many cases that people just did more than they were supposed to do. Maybe it didn't save anybody's life or anything like that, but it was beyond and above the call of duty. Everybody should, everybody I know. No, we did have some people in the outfit that uh, went AWOL, things like that, for which it got punished, but nobody ever deserted overseas or went AWOL overseas after we got over there. In training camps, oh, it's hard to keep them all straight because they don't have that compassion to fight for their country like we do when you get overseas. Then you think about the guy next to you, you got to take care of him because he's going to take care of you. So I never had a bad officer that I served for, especially my generals that were above me. I thought, always thought that they did the best they possibly could under the circumstances. I didn't like Patton. I didn't like him. But I had my, oh, God, I always, the old term, blood and guts, you see. I always thought, sometimes thought you're sacrificing men for territory and stuff like that. But when you look back over it, he really didn't. He was a splendid general. And sometimes I said, he didn't have to show off like that. That kind of got me sometimes. In fact, I in fact didn't like Patton's cursing. Sometimes his cursing was just out of the world. But nevertheless, I admired him, and he knew what he was doing and did with him. And by the way, I got to know his son real well after the war. But I do remember when we dropped the bombs on, because, and I'll always remember this, I was on a, boat in the harbor at La Havre, getting ready to come back to America. No, I said that wrong. Getting ready to go to Japan. Ah, I see. Getting ready to go to Japan. The way it turned out that the bomb dropped, and instead of going to Japan, or going to the Far East, I should say, we didn't know what we were going to do except to reinforce in the Far East. Go down through the Suez Canal and all the way around. That was the trip. None of us wanted that because we'd had enough of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have any desertions at the time either. So then I, uh, V8, that came off. Of course, you know, there have been a lot of complaints about that, dropping that bomb. That saved American lives, and it saved Japanese lives. The people don't stop to think about the way the Japanese would have fought us. House to house, all the way across, every person, we'd had to clear every village with artillery. We would have lost hundreds of thousands of men in that hand-to-hand -hand fighting. 
and we would have had to kill millions upon millions of Japanese in order to do it because we would want to bomb the cities rather than send our people in. So those two bombs made the Japanese suddenly realize there was no way to do it. And until they were dropped, they were going to fight to the last man. So I'd say the two bombs saved lives, both American and Japanese. And uh, my own personal life, I think, was uh, certainly altered a great deal because I would have been going over there to well, lay a help land in Japan. But that was our mission. Let's take, take Japan. We've got to finish this one off, too. So we didn't have to do that. We came home. Uh, I came home on what's called the Le Grand Victory, which is no, well, just converted, converted banana boat is what it was. So, <laughs> so we came across, uh, came into uh, Camp Shanks up the Hudson River. Got out there, and my, we didn't we didn't go somewhere and disband. We were disbanded actually at Camp Shanks. The battery turned in all of our equipment, everything else. Of course, that was kind of a surprise, you see. Well, we were supposed to go somewhere else. I was surprised to the Army. We thought we would be fighting in Japan for the next year or two. And they weren't prepared for all these troops to come home from uh, Europe to come back the same way we went out. They were planning for us all to come back into California or someplace. I was uh, coming home. I came through from Shank, came down to uh, Fort uh, Brad, to what Fort Gordon over in Augusta came from Gordon to Atlanta, and I got to Atlanta. Uh, had to pay some soldier. We paid him twenty-five bucks. I remember to bring us from there to Atlanta uh, ahead of time. Otherwise, I'd have to wait the next day, catch a bus, and all that stuff. All my equipment, a duffel bag full of, and a footlocker too. Officers have a footlocker. They uh, all of it with me. Got to Atlanta. And the driver took us down to the depot, the, old, the bus depot. And there I got a taxi cab to drive me out to the house. And it was raining, see? So it was raining, and here I had my foot locker and my duffel bag and, uh, and me in my uniform. And I got out of the uh, house over North Holland Avenue. I got out, and I expected, they knew I was coming, but they didn't know I was coming that soon, you know. Early in the morning, raining up a storm. It would would rain on my return home. So got out of the car, and here comes this little boy, and I knew he wasn't mine, you know. <laughs> he came running out to greet me. He was about six or eight years old, somewhere in that neighborhood. And my little girl, by this time, was about five or six. He ran out to meet me, you know. Nobody from my family. I knew the house was right there, double driveway between us, and he came from the other house. And I hugged him and carried on with him. He was just wonderful to meet a soldier, you know. He'd been well. And uh, nobody from our house came. So, but then finally they came out on the porch to realize I was there. And they greeted. And then I've met my family. You know, that was wonderful too. But you know, here about seven years ago when we moved into our, well, sometime recently, we moved into King's Bridge. And I was on the elevator one day, going up the elevator. And here's this man standing over there. And, to me, he was young, and he looked at me and said, You're General Dye, aren't you? I said, Yes. Uh, how'd you know that? And said, I, I don't know whether I said that or not. I said something to the effect. But he actually reached over and he hugged me, this stranger to me, see? Well, that, that's the, I went on up and uh, got off the elevator, and he went on up to another floor and said, Well, maybe people are friendly, you know, so I let it go at that. <laughs> And maybe he was appreciating the fact that I was, had been in the Army. I wasn't in the uniform or anything. It turned out that uh, a little later on I met a lady who I didn't know before either who lived next door to my wife, that house next door. And it was her son that had run out to meet me. And her son, her son had been up to see her that day. And he apparently had told her he'd met General Dye, or whatever, whatever you call me, the General Dye. And uh, then I said, uh, well, how do you know it was me, you know? And apparently he just figured it out somehow or another, but that's the same little old boy that had run out that day for that rain too. Fifty, <laughs> roughly 50 years later. Well, after that, I uh, got out of the Army and 
stayed in the reserve, started a construction company with my brother, mm -hmm. called it Die Construction Company. We prospered until the Korean came along, and here I was in the reserve, so I got called up again. Mm -hmm. This time, I was a major, and uh, went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and because I went to Georgia Tech and was an engineer, they put me on the faculty at Fort Sill. So for the first two years of the Korean War, I was uh, teaching gunnery, advanced gunnery at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And I could always talk about experiences, you know, since I'd been an artillery officer. And then I went to Korea. After Korea, I decided there's no reason for me to get out of the Army again. So I stayed in the Army for the next, uh, well, a total of uh, 32 years altogether. And I served, uh, I did a tour in Korea on the Military Armistice Commission where I met with the communists uh, 117 times out in the demilitarized zone out there where they uh, was always some atrocity or something like that occurred, trying to keep the war from getting restarted in Korea. Mm -hmm. See, that's the purpose of an armistice. An armistice is only to keep the fighting stopped until a more lasting solution be a peace treaty or something can occur. But after that, I did a tour at uh, Iowa State College PMS and T, ROTC again, see? Mm -hmm. After that, you know, I came back to Atlanta. No, I went to Pentagon for a couple of years. Germany for three more years. Back into uh, War College, into the Pentagon for three years, and Secretary of Defense's office this time. I was there during the Vietnam War and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Got out and came back to Atlanta, worked as Deputy Commissioner of Industry and Trade for the state of Georgia for six years. And you know, you wouldn't believe something stupid like this, but I left industry and trade so I could run for mayor of Atlanta. He spent, uh, he spent five dollars for every vote he had. Uh -huh. I mean, as far as campaign money is concerned, right. I spent 15 cents for every vote I got, because <laughs> I didn't spend any money. <laughs> and he didn't beat me too badly. 